Welcome back, Richard. It's good to see you after we, we took a week off. We did. My fault. Yeah, well, that's all right. You, you had some things going on. And, and even today, you're, you're in a new location because you, you were out late celebrating birthday and all kinds of things. So, uh, But it's good to see you again this morning. Right. Yeah, I'm restricted. Uh, my movements are restricted. And um, not for any legal reason, but because I had a minor knee surgery, I had to have a little bit of a knee repair. Nothing dramatic like a replacement, but I'm not allowed to do anything. So I'm confined to my house for a couple of couple more days. So yeah. here I am in part of my kitchen. So I apologize for the background. So well, well somebody's got to restrict you in some way. So that's, that's right. That's right. There's the restrictions are necessary for a number of reasons. But anyway, it's good to see you again. Yeah. Um, it's nice to be able to um, emerge a little bit from my captivity, but um, it's good to see you again. How are you doing, by the way? I'm doing well. Thank you very doing much. Doing okay? Yeah, doing yeah, I never get to see you. What's in the background there? Um, I, I finally got some shelves up and with my some of my Star Wars and, and Lego minifigures. So uh, you can't- They're tiny. They're, well, hence the name, minifigures. They're, they're small. <laughs> Um, maybe I didn't miss you. Um, um, no, because you had the Christmas tree up there for a while. Yeah. And now yeah. the shelves, but the shelves are permanent. Yes, for okay. the most part. Um, okay. Yeah. But uh, okay. so I got it. There, there are all kinds of minifigures up there. Some Star Wars and some Marvel comics and stuff. When I worked in, um, when I worked in one of those high tech places, mm -hmm. we had a room full of computer uh, programmers, mm -hmm. and all of them had collections of various kinds of statues and things that, of course, I didn't recognize at the time. <laughs> at the time, <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, yes. that's what you have there. You, you're like one of those technology guys. Okay, I'll, I'm not sure if I should take that as a positive <laughs> right. well, you're our technology guy in the office so maybe it's maybe it's appropriate all right well thank you okay. very much. so um well today we're going to have our conversation um well the last time we met we, were, we talked about a childhood divorce right we said right. we'll come back next time and talk about uh talk about a little bit more about um some other pitfalls and some issues that happen um, that are not so good for kids um, when families get divorced and separated. And right. so we're going to continue that conversation today. Right. Um, so uh, because it's a very important thing, it, it happens often. Uh, many relationships end in divorce. And, um, you know, we often think about the process of the divorce and things like that, but it's also what happens after the divorce that can be so um, influential on the development of the child. That's right. I think there's, you know, when it comes to divorce, I think you have to think of it in, in three acts, three phases. One, uh, one in phase one, you have all of the um, couples problems that occur during, dr prior to the divorce. Okay? Right. So how, how did you get to a divorce? We got there because of disagreements and arguments and, and right. fighting. Then you have the divorce, the legal work involved in getting a divorce, which is in itself uh, traumatic for everybody. And then the third phase is after the divorce. And when I say after the divorce, I mean, after the papers are signed and sent to the court. Okay, mm -hmm. but, And that's a, that's a significant event. And I'll explain why later. But then you have, especially if you have children, what is what happens in the third phase? And that's kind of what we want to talk about today is you've right. been through two traumas already. One is the disagreements that led to the divorce. Second is the legal process of divorcing. Now you're divorced and now you have the responsibility of, co of hopefully co-parenting the children. Right, absolutely. And, you know, let's, let's not, um, th there is no doubt that a, a divorce has an effect, um, creates <clears throat> some change. That's right. In the child, in the parents, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it creates some change. Now, sometimes, uh, often, if things aren't done correctly, that change can be a negative change. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But but I think that it is important to note that there are many times as well that the change can be a positive thing. Um, you, you know, there's plenty of research to suggest that um, couples should not stay together, you know, quote right. unquote, for the sake of the children. Um, right. You know, unhealthy marriages, unhealthy relationships, 
um, whether a child is involved or not, <clears throat> those, those kinds of marriages um, are not healthy and they do damage themselves. Right, um, right. We, we mentioned last time that there, there is some research that suggests that a lot of the damage that um, can be done to children is done prior to the divorce even happening because That's of right. the, the, the toxicity of the relationship. So um, what it is important to know that even though um, a, a divorce can be difficult for a child, um, avoiding a divorce isn't divorce isn't necessarily better if it's in the, if it's a relationship that you know is unhealthy. Right. You know, a generation ago, um, prior, you know, as divorces were really beginning to increase in the in the 60s and the 70s, and um, the, the percentage of marriages that uh, were, were ending in divorce began to really increase. Um, there was a there was a flurry of research about what divorce, how divorce affects children. And is it better to stay in a dysfunctional marriage? Or is it better to get divorced? Um, both, either one is bad. Um, either one of those things is going to have a negative effect on children. Okay, if you stay, if you stay in a dysfunctional marriage, you're exposing children to that dysfunction, to the anger. If you get divorced, you're exposing them to the effects of divorce. So the answer to both, yes, it's it's bad either way. Okay, um, no matter the age of the children, even young adult children are going to be negatively affected by a divorce. Um, it doesn't, it, there's just no way to shield everybody from it. Absolutely. So, so when it happens, <clears throat> obviously there's a lot of emotions and a lot of challenges that come about as a result of, um, you know, when a divorce is happening and when a marriage is, is, is ending. Um, right. And we talked, you know, last time about sort of those three emotions. We talked about <laughs> loss, fear, and anger. That's right. Um, and, and that those emotions can become supercharged during this mm -hmm. time um, of the divorce. Right. Yeah. Those are the big three. I mean, I mean, everybody I talk to who's going through a divorce, everybody feels lost. Everybody has uh, is afraid. Uh, what What will the future look like? Right. And and there's anger. There there is bound to be anger. And it's not just the attorneys who create the anger. People always, you know, it's like, well, the attorneys create it. No, the anger's there, um, and it's exacerbated as you begin to divide your property, as you begin to talk about your children's schedules. Um, people are bound to be to feel some anger, and so those are the three emotions that that parents have to manage: is loss, fear, and anger. And and you're going to have to come to terms with those, and you're going to have to manage those. Right, absolutely. And so you know, but. Instead of letting those emotions take over, you know, we, we have to keep those emotions in check. And, and we can do that by keeping a few things in mind. You know, right. when there's a divorce, there everybody always walks away with less than you had before, right? Yeah. Em emphasize that again. Yeah. It's just you're going to have less. I'm sorry. Yeah. And 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 you know, there's this whole idea that people have that things have to be fair. Um mm -hmm. and and you know, it, it's not fair. Um, and it's not fair for anyone. Right. Uh, so, so we need to kind of back off of that idea of, of well, it's got to be fair. It's got to be equal. Somehow equal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's those kinds of things just don't exist. You can talk about equal when it comes to things. Right. Um, yeah. But, but with the emotions and with the what, what I want and what, what you want and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's never going to be completely fair and balanced. Right. We just need to kind of back away from that idea. Right, right. And also, don't try to win. Um, uh, you know, the, the people enter divorces as though it's some kind of a competition that I have to get more than my partner or my partner's getting more than I am. If you can just get to okay, you know, the, the, this is except what I have is acceptable. I don't like it. I would like to have more, but I can live with this. Okay, just get to, I can live with this. Don't get, it, it's very rare that you're gonna get, that either partner will ever get to, I, I came out on top. Everybody's going to have less. Right, and, and, and the, the real damage that that does is um, when we get into that mindset is that it just drags the process out so long. That, That's that, right. You, you need to get through that divorce process as quickly as possible, because the, the longer it goes, the more damage that it's doing. That's right. You, 
you have, a, if, if you continue the divorce process, remember the divorce, the legal process, that's what we call phase two. You know, you, you had the earlier problems, but now you're in phase two. Phase two is going to create loss, fear, and anger. Mm -hmm. And what you want to do is you want to minimize those because the longer those three things linger, the more damage you're going to do to everybody. Okay. And so you want to get through the legal part of the divorce as quickly as possible. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> because the healing doesn't begin until after that can't begin until after that uh, process is over and, and you're unti everything's untied and, right. and you are, you know, be able to begin that phase three of the process. You know, I've been doing some work in um, relationship um, uh, termination, the terminating a relationship. And it doesn't matter whether it's a marriage or you're just dating or you, you know, you've fallen in love with somebody and you've been together for a few months or a year or so. Um, it's very uncoupling, breaking up, uh, separating. And in this case, divorcing um, is a very difficult thing to do. And one of the things we're learning is that the healing process, the process of moving forward doesn't begin until you acknowledge that this relationship is over. You, you can't begin the healing process until you can say to yourself, this is over, it's not going to come back, we're not going to get together again, this relationship has ended and I need to move on. And for some strange reason, that doesn't happen until the divorce agreement is final. Um, while you're divorcing, you're still very much connected and the relationship still exists. And you can't get to that point of this relationship is over mm -hmm. because the legal process of divorcing keeps the two of you connected, keeps the relationship alive. Right. And so remember, your healing is not going to begin until that divorce, until you've signed the papers and it's, it's in the hands of the court. Now it is a legal separation and divorce. And yeah. now, you could, now you can say to yourself, this is over. Mm -hmm. Now it's time to move on. And I think that that's a good point that, that, you know, it really, it's when you realize that the relationship is over and it's not going to get back and it's not going to, because when there's children involved, right. there's yeah. always going to be some connection. Um, right. And, and so, you know, if there's no kids, it's very easy for, you know, one person to walk one way, the other person to walk another way and right. not look back and everything's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but when, when there's kids involved, there's going to be some connection. You're going to have to continue to communicate. You're going to have to continue to see each other from time to time. And so, um, you know, that, that appreciation that, okay, the relationship is over and it's not going to come back again. Um, and, and, you know, that, that can really only begin once the ink is dry, as you said. Um, but it's, it's not until we have that appreciation that we can really then move forward. Sure. And you mentioned another important point. You talked about uh, disconnecting all the ways that you were connected before. You, you referred to it as untying the knots. It, think about it for a moment. Um, when you're married, you have so many ways that you're connected to each other, birthdays, holidays, possessions, mm -hmm. shared possessions. Um, if you have a vacation house, um, you know, you have your, your, your family home, but you might have a, a, a cottage or a lake house or a vacation house somewhere. Um, things you own together. Until you untie and disconnect all those things that connect you, again, the healing process can't can't continue. And the more connections you have, the more, the more difficult it's going to be, the, the longer it's going to take to separate. We often say to people, if you're, if you're going to get divorced, do it before you have children, because children really bind you together forever. I mean, there's just no way to escape that. But the more things you have connecting you, um, the longer it's going to take to untie all those things. And again, you're not going to begin to move forward until you've disconnected all the things that once connected you. Right, right. So once the, once the divorce is done um, and, and you go through the process, like we talked about last time of a child-centered divorce so that you know, everybody's managing their own emotions. They, oh, they're right. so dealing with their own things. They're not doing things that's going to make it more difficult for the children. Um, you know, then we can start talking about, you know, this idea of, of phase three and in phase three contains many of the same things that we talked about with the divorce, you know, um, 
for example, um, we, we have to keep in mind what's in the best interest of the kids. Right. Um, because, you know, there, it, so often, so often each parent thinks that what they want is in the kid's best interest. <laughs> but then they end up doing things like, um, my goodness, they weaponize this idea of I'm going to do this, what's in the best interest of the kids. That's right. And, and it's not, many times it's not at all what the kids want. You, you, you probably don't agree on what's best for the children. I mean, and I think parents need to understand they, they use this phrase, well, it's in the best interest of the child. That's going to depend on which parent you're talking to. Oh. Hopefully, you agree. Hopefully, right. you agree that going to this school is in the best interest of the child. But it's not likely that you're going to agree on what's in the best interest of the child. Okay? Right. Um, you, you just got divorced for some significant reasons. Right. And, and, and so you may not agree on what's in the best interest of the child. Right. And, and you know, many times it, it appears at least that parents are using that to get what they want. Exactly. And that's, then that brings up this notion of is your post-divorce life going to be parent-centered or child-centered? Right. Okay. And th because that's what we're talking about here is Am I going to am I going to be more concerned about what I get and what my influence is and what I'm able to do, or am I concerned about my uh, or am I concerned about the welfare of my children? Right, right. And, and so, just as the divorce can be parent centered or child centered, um, the post divorce phase three, as you called it right. a minute ago, that can be parent centered or child centered as well. And, That's right. And that's yeah. child centered because again when you're really talking about doing what's in the best interest of the child, sometimes it's not what you want. And, and we just have to right. be able to be okay with that. That's right. And the other thing, when you talk about um, children and, and adjusting to a divorce, one of the things that we often say, and I think it's more to rationalize uh, the decision to divorce is well, kids are resilient. They're going to manage this okay. Uh, they're going to adjust. When it comes to divorce, kids are not as resilient or understanding uh, as we might hope that they would be. Um, kids really struggle. I um, had, we had a divorce in the family. Uh, it was a cousin or something. And their children were in their 20s. And they had an extraordinary, I mean, they were grown adults. They were, they had uh, college graduates and they were out living their own lives. And when their parents announced that they were divorcing, I think they call it a gray divorce now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it's the, when, when people who have been together for more than 30 years or something, when they're older and they have gray hair, that's um, called a gray divorce. Even a gray divorce is difficult on the adult children because it's going to affect where they go for holidays, how they celebrate birthdays, how they're going to tell the grandchildren. And so, um, so regardless of the age, it's not like this age can, every age suffers. Right. Little children, um, preschoolers, they have one kind of struggle. School-aged children have another kind of struggle. Teenagers have another kind of struggle. Adult children have another kind of struggle. And they're not as resilient as we think they are. And right. if, you're, if you're divorcing or if you are divorced, you need to think about the effects that it's having on the children. You have to manage your emotions so that your children are able to make this enormous adjustment that they had no control over. Right, yes. I, I, was, in, I was in a later teen uh, when my parents divorced. Oh, okay. Um, okay. I was, I think, 16, 17. I, I was just, mm -hmm. just before, a little bit before I graduated high school. And it was, it was interesting because it's like, on one hand, I knew very well that my parents needed to be divorced. They, right. they yeah. didn't get along very well. There was lots of arguing and, um, and I can remember all of that. But, but then when they did get divorced, uh, when it did actually happen, it, it was really difficult and it changed things. And, it, and it, wasn't, it wasn't so much that I wanted them to get back together, um, but it did have an effect on you know, what I did when I finished high school, I, you know, just things that you don't necessarily think about. It changed what happened when I finished high school and was going to college. It, it changed my senior year completely. Um, because oh, that's right. Yeah. All of those dynamics changed. And, and it wasn't, again, it, it wasn't because I wanted them to stay together or it, mm -hmm. because I, you know, I needed that 
particular thing to happen or anything like that. It was just that it was different. And in that difference, when you're in the midst of living your life, right, that difference um, has an effect. That's right. You, this is the only life you knew for your entire life. If you right. were 16 years old, this is everything you knew for 16 years suddenly, abruptly comes to an end. That's not an easy thing to adjust to. I mean, right. that's asking a lot of anybody at any age. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So And so again, it's not so much that it shouldn't happen or, or like with mine, it should, like, that it shouldn't have happened. It absolutely should have because it was just not a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. But it change it creates change and change is always difficult and so right. um you know so we have to have that understanding yeah. and that appreciation mm -hmm. that the better we do as the adults that are being that are separating the the adults that are divorcing the better we do the better the kids are going to do right. Um, right. and and you know if we're suffering and and we're struggling and fighting they're going to experience that as well. And, right. and we, we have to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the better you do uh, as parents, the better the parents do, the better the children do. Everybody's going to suffer emotionally. Everybody's going to pay a price. Right. But you want to minimize that price. And the easiest way to minimize it is for the parents to manage their emotions. Because the better you do through this whole process, the better your children are going to do. Absolutely. And, and, and so... You know, keeping in mind that the, the parents are getting divorced, you know, the kids aren't getting divorced, the, right. the kids are still going to be need to have a relationship with both of you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is something that I think a lot of people, a lot of people really struggle with. Um, and, and they struggle with it because, um, you know, they, they project their anger with their former spouse uh, onto their children by saying, well, it's not safe for my kids to be with my ex-spouse mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I really can't be with that person. I can't, right. um, mm -hmm. you know, I can't trust that person. I can't right. um, be in a relationship with that person. And so I'm really concerned about my kids having a relationship with that person. Right. And, and it creates this dynamic that can be, that, you know, really can cause some damage to a child mm -hmm. because that is the child's father. That is the child's mother. Mm -hmm. um, and, whether you can get along with that person or not, um, right. the, the child is going to do better if they ha can have a re healthy relationship with that person. That's right. It's the parents who are divorcing. Right. No, it's not the kids who have asked for a divorce, though some children might right. um, want to divorce a parent or both parents. But it, typically, it's the parents who are divorcing. The children, the children aren't divorcing their parents. Okay. Right. And so don't, don't put them in a situation where they feel that they have to choose sides right. I mean, that, that they have to manage a relationship with each of you. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so, so keep in mind that as this is all happening and, and the child is trying to adapt and adjust and that the child is trying to cope with these feelings that they don't, they didn't necessarily choose to take upon themselves. Right. Um, they, they may hide their true feelings and just, and for no other reason to spare you hurt. That's um, right. They, they may regress a little bit and act out right. a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. They may tell you how horrible things are over at their other parent's house. And then they may tell the other parent how horrible things are at your house. That's right. Uh, and that happens. You know, they, time. for example, a child knows if the mother hates the father, okay, the child then can't come back from the fathers and see how wonderful it was because the child knows, even a young child knows that that's gonna hurt mom's feelings. Right. And so you hide your emotions. Oh no, it's horrible over there to sort of validate mom's emotions, okay? So they say, oh, I hate going to dad's. Mom hears that and says, oh, there's something wrong at dad's, okay? And so then you begin this problem, this process of alienation, you know, that, oh, he's not safe at his dad's. No, it's not that he's not safe, is that he doesn't want to report how happy he is at, it might be at dad's because he knows it's going to hurt your feelings. Right. And that's what we mean about you have to manage your emotions so that your children don't have to. Right. Absolutely. And, and it, that, happens, that happens so much more often than anyone, that, than most parents consider. That's um, right. Because... That's right. Kids are just, it's just what kids do. Um, that, that's, you know, their relatively immature perspective and views of relationships. 
Um, you know, I, I say what I need to say to make this person happy. Then I have to say what I need to say to make that person happy. That's right. Um, right. And that's just, that's just how it works. Right. So, um, so yeah, don't, don't, don't forget that parents. That happens all the time. That's right. That's right. They, they might be sparing your feelings and, and not giving you an accurate picture of what's going on because they want to spare your feelings. That's great that kids are doing that, but it makes it more difficult. Again, it makes the emotional burden more difficult. Right. And, and what that what that kind of leads to for parents, though, is that it, it, it leads parents into this sort of booby trap right. of, of then seeking, working to seek the favor and, and loyalty of the children. It's, you know, mm-hmm. OK, well, you know, he said that he doesn't really like it at mom's house. So I need to I need to do <clears throat> things to make sure that he really likes it at my house. Right. And so right. it may be really subtle things like you know, well, whenever I go pick him up, I'm going to take him to the store. So he really likes it at my house and I'm going to get right. him some things. Um, mm-hmm. you know, it's, a, it's almost like a grooming. Um, right. I don't think it's always so like in the front of the parent's mind that this is what I'm doing. Right, right. But, but it does happen, you know, where right. parents do these things to, to seek that loyalty and, and favor of the kids. You know, we talk about the things like the Disney dad, you know, where the dad doesn't know what to do with, especially young children. So they, they take them to Disney World. You know, mom, mom's doing homework with the kids to keep them on track academically. And dad is taking the kids to Disney World. Well, then, then you get into that situation of, yeah, he likes going to dad's because there are no rules. He likes going to dad's because they go to Disney World every weekend. And I can't do that because I have to take them to um, their, their soccer games and we have to go to tutoring and right. we have all these other obligations to taking care of the house that we have to do. Um, and so you get into that dichotomy that dichotomous relationship and those don't end well right and and, and th- there's even other subtle ways like um well he has his xbox at mom's house but he doesn't have an xbox at dad's house that's tr- um, absolutely so, true yeah so it's like man i really like where does he want to be because <laughs> that's where my xbox is yeah I sure, where I have the xbox is everything. sure i have to do i don't care about <laughs> i don't care but, which parent it is right. i want to be where the xbox is exactly yeah right. so so you know we have to we have to recognize some of those things and i'm not saying you know you should have an xbox at both houses you know right. not necessarily right. but you know what what richard what do parents say well he's not going to take something from my house over to his dad's house or from dad's <laughs> house over to mom's house right um and that is absolutely true. That should that sometimes that should not happen right. because it's not good for things to be taken from one house and being left at another house. That goes back to that. There's more connection there because right. now, okay, now mom has to contact dad and go over to dad's to get the stuff that they left over there, and so that they can have it because you know she can't go to sleep without this this plush toy that right. she has. So she, we mm-hmm. have to go back and get it. Now that just creates more connection and more interaction that may not be healthy. That's right. That's right. It certainly isn't healthy for the kids because now that's, you know, um, you know, we really didn't talk about it before, but, you know, when there is more connection between the parents, when the right. parents are seeing each other very often, even though they're divorced, when they're seeing each other very often, it can create a lot of confusion for the kids because the kids are like, wait a minute, they're, they live in different places, but they're together all the time. That's right. Right. It, why aren't they? T- why can't we be together? That doesn't make sense. And right. so it, it makes that healing process take a lot longer. It takes um, longer, right. So, so, you know, but we kind of back to the point that we're making here, we, we have to keep, um, we have to remember that, you know, the things that we do at the house <clears throat> to try to keep the kids happy, you know, we have to be careful that that's <clears throat> not a, a subtle attempt to to keep the kids on our side. That that's right. And that's that's exactly the point is that, if, and I'm going to talk about this idea of grooming. You don't want to win the favor of your children. That's not the goal here, okay? Because right. the, the, that's a win-win. That's, that's a win-lose thing. You know, I'm going to be a better parent. I'm going to be the better parent. Um, and so I'm going to do these things. And what you're really after is the loyalty of your child. You want your child to, to see you as the better parent, Okay. That, and a subtle way of doing that is to give them more toys and to give them cell phones and to give them video games and not have any curfews. I don't care what else you call, you're grooming your child. Right. Hey, and, and you can't do that. Yeah. And let's just, let's just say it because it's true. Um, it feels nice when, you're, when your kid says that they prefer to be at your place. 
when your kid says, I, 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 rather, I would rather be at mom's house, that feels right. good. Mm-hmm. Now, it's not great. It's not a good thing. Um, no, it's not good for the kid. It's not good for the kid, but it feels nice right. as a parent. Again, it feels good to the parent. I'm, my, my, the parent's emotions are intact, mm-hmm. but not. But but the kids are not going to be. I mean, because you're you're setting up this this division again. You know that you're you're the better parent. You're the preferred parent, right? And you have to avoid that. When, right. If you're going to co-parent, you have to avoid that temptation. And that temptation exists in every marriage and every divorce. Right. Now, now the more the more toxic, the more. Um, malicious way that uh, that this is done is through something called alienation and and there's Mm -hmm. a a whole idea of parent alienation syndrome and things like that and we're really not going to get into that too much here i don't think because Mm -hmm. that is it's a very interesting concept and and i'm not sure um I, I have I, I know I have very mixed feelings about it. I, I have certainly seen situations where that's happening, but I've seen right. many more situations where that's been accused and it's not happening. Right. So, um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I think it's overused in, in some situations, again, because I need to win or I need that loyalty. You know, parents will do those kinds of things that are, or at least claim those kinds of things are happening. Right. Um, rather than look at themselves at what they're doing so yeah so but 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 you're right it's it's in with grooming it's i want to win the favor of the children with alienation it's i want to turn the kids against the other parent right very different process okay very destructive and as you say a very toxic process where you actively seek to turn the children against the parent right absolutely so so the bottom line is is that it's really in the kid's best interest if they have a good, strong, healthy relationship with both parents, right. um, you know, we need to resist that urge, that tendency to want them to, to be our ally, to be mm-hmm. our, on our team. Right. Um, again, you know, you, it's already been proven that you don't get along with the other parent. That's why there's a divorce. And That's why you're divorcing. Once right. it's done, you're not anymore. You don't have to be partners from that perspective anymore. Right. You have to be allies. Mm-hmm. You have to be allies with each other because you have the same goal, right? But you don't have to be. You're, you're not partners in that sense anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, the goal is that to to recognize that the kids have to be um, have good relationships with both of you if you want them to continue to be healthy. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll I'll say that for you are divorced. You are no longer a couple, and, right. and the, the the difficult part of co-parenting is that on the one hand, you have to recognize that your former spouse has the right to do whatever he or she feels is in the best interest of the child, okay? One of the difficulties we get into, um, you you mentioned the Xbox, but buying a car Mm -hmm. or or having a cell phone, okay? If the parents don't agree uh, for example, um, the child turns 16 and one of the parents says, well, I'm going to buy her a car. And the other parent says, well, I don't want her to have a car yet. Mm-hmm. Okay. If the mother decides to buy the child a car, that is her right. Right. And I'm no longer married to her. So I have, I can't tell her not to do that. Right. If, if I want to buy my daughter a car, <laughs> Somebody who's not married to me has no voice in that. I mean, it, you know, right. a, a co-worker doesn't get to make, because we're not married to each other. Right. Well, once you get divorced, you're not married to each other anymore. Right. And you just have to grin and bear it. If, if the other partner says, I'm going to buy her a car, you can't prevent that from happening. Right. The best you can do is manage that difference. Right. And, and you know, you can... And, and what you can do is you can say, well, you know what? She can have the car at your place, but she's not going to have the car at my place. Right. Now, okay, that is absolutely possible. But think about what that's going to do to the kid. That's right. Well, that's if I'm right. at mom's, I mean, you just imagine. If I'm at mom's, I have access to a car where I can you know, go to the store or I can meet up with my friends if I want to. When right. I go to dad's, I'm not going to be able to do those things. Right. That's where, right. Again, your question, where are they going to want to be? <laughs> Um, right. And, you know, the dad in that situation, the dad may see it that, well, mom's just trying to, you know, win favor. Mom's, okay, m- maybe. But 
a lot of times 16 year olds need cars because they have they have obligations and things that they need to do that mm -hmm. you know you can't just always be the taxi right. so this is all the the reason why parents have to be able to communicate um again you're not partners anymore you don't have to always agree but you you have to find a way to negotiate right right that's right because if not if the if the gap between the two parents becomes too large, then the kids are going to manipulate that. Um, not because they're bad kids, but that's what kids do. That's what we all do. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. We'll all take advantage Ourselves. of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so we need to we need to resist that tendency to bring the kid towards <laughs> us to be our ally, to be on our team, and right. in, encourage that healthy relationship and, and a new relationship with both right. parents. You know, um, the other thing is that. A lot of times, um, you know, a lot of times kids grow up and, and are closer, at least emotionally closer to their mom than they are to dad. Just right. Especially, yeah, especially, especially. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and so, um, you know, now they're going to have to have a new kind of relationship with dad because now instead of mom preparing dinner every night or instead of mom tucking us in at night, it's going to be mm -hmm. dad doing that whenever we're over there. And right. that may be different. Um especially, you know, if there's work schedules that were different and mm -hmm. especially if it's a role that dad just didn't have before, he's going to have to learn how to do that. Right. Or, or vice versa. It could be either direction. Right. So, so as the parent, you know, we have to work to, to help foster that. Not that I have to do that for my ex-spouse, not that I, right. not that it's my obligation to say, um, well, you know, this is what you need to do to, to make your, you know, to have a good relationship with your dad, or this is what you need to do to, to get, you know, in good with your mom. That's not my responsibility. That's the other parent's responsibility to, to forge that healthy relationship. I just can't st stand in the way. Right. I got to, right. I'm not doing anything to prevent that from happening. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so it's not easy. Right. So what we want to avoid, what the, the first phase of co-parenting is, we want to avoid what are called loyalty traps, right. uh, where, where you seek, as you said a minute ago, uh, the ch you want the child on your team. You want the child to, to agree with you and to side with you against the other parent. And you have to avoid the, these four loyalty traps. Right. Okay. And the first is to use the, using the child as a spy. As a spy, right. right. When they come back to your, when they come to your place, you start giving them the third degree, asking questions. What was going on? Hey, when you, let me know what your dad's doing. You know, what does your dad do on Friday nights? Um, who does he have over to his house? You know, right. don't, don't, don't try to get the kids to report back to you about what's going on at the other parent's house. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. Yeah, because once again, um, they, even kids who are, even young children, eight, nine, 10 years old, if they know that their parents have an acrimonious our relationship, and they're always fighting with each other. Um, those even young children know that any information they provide could be used against the other parent. Okay, Absolutely. and so it puts them in a terribly difficult situation. Okay, they're trying not to take sides, but you keep dragging them in to your struggle with the other parent. And right. as we said earlier, many times children will lie; they'll fib. Right. And they'll say, oh, no, I hate going to dad's. He's, he's be mean and he's this and he's that simply to spare your feelings. But right. you're, we have to remember, you're not getting, you are probably not getting accurate information from your child. Right. And, and remember, too, that there's also this, this other side of, of things that can happen. It's, um, you know, there, there are times, many times when kids want their parents to get back together. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, the whole idea of the parent trap, right, where the, the kids will create these scenarios to try to mm -hmm. get the parents to interact again. Right. Um, so if, if I know mm -hmm. that saying things to you, to mom, is going to make mom talk to dad. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I'm going to say certain things to mom to increase the likelihood that she's going to talk to dad, even if it's not healthy. But remember, <laughs> If the child's entire life was full of you, the two of you arguing, right? saying something to you so that you argue with dad isn't necessarily a bad thing, because that's what it was like when y'all lived together. Right. So, so think it's not that big of a deal to, to now say something to, to entice mom to argue with dad. That's right. Think of it. Children, children will take negative attention just to get attention. Absolutely. They don't have any problem with that. You know, they'd rather have their parents fighting and together than apart and not fighting. Right. So, mm -hmm. so either way, they, they could say things to encourage 
an argument or a fight, or or they could say things um, to to discourage you from thinking that they're having a good time over there. Right. Um, yeah. But but kids, you know, you know you, we can't put full credit into everything that they say, and we can't that's take right. what the kid says and say, okay, that's it, I'm going to court because he said right. that dad, you know, uh, right. made a cold bath. Um, we 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 can't we, we can't do that. Yeah, so, so the, the, the biggest the way to avoid this is as tempting as it is, and my God, anybody who's been divorced knows how tempting it is to have your children report back of what your former spouse is doing. What your former spouse is doing is no longer your right. concern, any more than what I'm doing is your concern. We're not married. You don't care what I do on Fridays. Well, now you're divorced, so you can't, you have to stop caring about what your former partner has, is doing. Um, it, it, but don't put your children in that position. Right. It's unfair, it's unwise, um, and it's going to be ultimately destructive. Right. Yeah. Right. The, the second trap is using the child as a messenger. Um, so, so this is like you giving your child an assignment uh, of information or whatever to pass on to the other parent. Mm -hmm. um, th this is especially problematic with younger kids. Um, right. You know, if it's a 15, 16, 17 year old and you say, well, let your dad know, make sure you let your dad know about your soccer schedule. That's different. Um, you know, that's that's a kid that's old, certainly old enough to be able to handle those kinds of right. like, communication. Mm -hmm. um, but with younger kids, you know, you, you can't you can't rely on the child to pass on information to the other mm -hmm. because um, it, because, well, first of all, it's just not reliable. I mean, you don't know for certain that the kid is giving them the right message. Mm -hmm. um, but it, but that's just an issue that shouldn't be used. That's right. And there are messaging systems. Um, yeah. But, and you even have to be careful of those. Just don't, don't abuse those messaging systems. And many parents do. They overwhelm the other person with, message, with, message, with right. messages. These are meant to facilitate communication. They should be short and used infrequently. The fewer, the less communication you have, in many cases, the less communication you have, the better, okay? Right. So don't, don't abuse those messaging systems. Control your emotions. Don't, don't overwhelm your former partner with, and people do that. I mean, I have many, many families that are co-parenting mm -hmm. and they just overwhelm the other person with messages. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to trap the other parent uh, with, a, with a specific detail. Like, uh, you know, I was, you were, you were five minutes late today and they blow up the messaging system for five minutes. I mean, right. don't, don't, don't abuse the messaging system. Don't use your children, but don't abuse the messaging, messaging system that you have. Right, absolutely. The third trap is using the child as a confidant. And mm -hmm. my goodness, this happens so often right. where suddenly you, you know, the eight-year-old child becomes your therapist. Um, right. And, and I, it's so difficult to, to really understand outside of just knowing <clears throat> that, well, now that parent, um, you know, we talked about the loss that, that comes right. in a divorce. You know, sometimes that loss is um, friends, you know, the, the friends will take the other person's side and, right. and so then you're left without the same friend group that you had before. Right. And so who else do you talk to? Well, you're, you're, if your kids are there, if you don't have much, many other family mm -hmm. members that you can talk to or anything right. like that, sometimes it's just the child that's left to, to talk to. Right. We have to really avoid that. Um, and instead, you know, get your, get a real therapist, <laughs> get somebody else that you can talk to that's confidential, um, but don't use your child for that. Yeah, find an adult to confide in. Um, even if, you know, many parents are tempted if they have teenage children um, to confide in their teenage children. And, but again, what you want, you, you're, you're trying to get your child to side with you. And, and remember, we said, that's not, that's not an appropriate thing to do. We know that you're hurting. We know how difficult it is for you, but you don't pass that on to your children and you don't ask them because no matter how angry or hurt you might be with your partner, you cannot interfere with your child's relationship with the, with the other parent, okay? Right. We know it's difficult. My goodness, this is a, one of the most tumultuous things you're ever going to go through. So we know the enormity of, of how difficult it is, but you have to curb that emotion to pass this on to your children. Right. And, and that really leads us to this, to the fourth and final uh, trap. And that mm -hmm. is, as we said before, you know, using the child as the, as an ally. Um, right. 
you know, a lot of times parents that are divorced will do things to gain sympathy or to gain that, you know, that connection with the child um, that does kind of turn them against or pull them away from their relationship with the other parent, right. um, you know, as though they can only have a relationship with one. Uh, it, right. it, it's confusing, but, you know, if, you know, parents will do things to show that, well, this is how hurt I am from this, from this divorce. And so the child feels sorry for them. Um, or, you know, they have other issues. And so uh, they have now financial issues, or they have, um, you know, emotional issues or medical issues. And, and so they, they sort of really pour that out so that the child sees that and sees the parent as really suffering. Mm -hmm. And then so the kid, you know, feels like they have to be protective. And so then, okay, they have to be on mom's side, uh, because she's really struggling, you know, dad's doing okay you know, dad's still working or whatever. And so I, I got to be on mom's side because she, now she doesn't have anybody. Um, exactly. Right. So we have to remember that the kid has to have a relationship with both parents. Right. And That's we right. have to avoid that tendency to, to try to pull them on as our, you know, our, our sole ally. That's right. That's right. You, you don't want to bring them in as a therapist, as a confidant, and you have no right to turn them into your ally because the other side of that coin is you're alienating them from the other parent. You're, they're, right. you're, you're asking the child to pick sides and that you have to avoid. Yeah, because, it, because if you think about it, from a at least from a child's perspective, for them to be loyal to you means that they have to be disloyal to the other parent. Right. They, right. they can't be loyal to both uh, because, you know, because you're divorced, because there was a conflict. And even if there's places where <laughs> they can be loyal to both of you, mm -hmm. Um, they're going to struggle with that because especially younger kids are very, um, they, they, they don't have the capacity to think in duality in that way, that That's this right. is a reality and this is a reality and both realities can exist at the same time. That's right. It's not until kids get much older that they can appreciate that. Right. My, you know, I can... I can look at a divorced couple and say, well, mom is telling this story and that's true for her. And dad is telling this story and that's true for him. So each one of them has a truth. Kids don't have the cognitive ability to do that. Right. They don't see, they, they, look for the per, they look for the parent who's lying. They, right. And they'll tell you that. They'll say, you can't both be telling me the truth. Right. Okay. One of you is lying. And so I have to figure out which parent is lying to me. What they don't realize is that neither parent is really lying. They're just telling their version of their truth. There are two truths, but the, cognitively kids can't grapple with the idea of having two truths. They look for the truth. And so you have to help your child understand that, they're, that, that's, that there are two truths. There are two stories here. Right, absolutely. And, and yeah, we have to really work hard to encourage the kids to appreciate that. So, right. so, so the takeaway is that you know, once the divorce is final and, and it's all done and, and signed and at the courthouse and now we're moving on and starting this next chapter of our life, parents, it's, it's so important that you encourage your kids to have the permission, the, the uh, of opportunity and the availability to have a relationship and to love both parents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we, if we think about what is the healthiest thing for kids, the healthiest thing for kids is to have good two good parents that um, are there for them and that support them and that they can confide in and that they can trust. Um, right. They they need to be on both teams, <laughs> and, and it's really difficult for them to do that if we're pulling them in one direction or pushing them in a different direction. Mm -hmm. um, we need to avoid those loyalty traps. Uh, right. they, what, what is that's right? What what's in the best interest of children is to have permission to have a relationship with both parents, right. whatever, whatever that relationship looks like. If, we, if you can give your children permission to love and respect and have a relationship with the other parent, then you let your child work out that relationship with the other parent. That's, that's up to them how to do that, okay? And your influence is going to be limited. Like it or not, your influence is going to be limited. Remember, we began by saying in a divorce, everybody ends up with less. You right. end up with less money, less goods, and less influence. Okay, right. and so you just you just have to you just have to accept that, and say and and give your child permission to have a relationship with each of you. Right, a absolutely, and and it's not going to necessarily be exactly the way that you want it to be. It's not, not going, going exactly right. the way that you want it to look, 
but it's going to be what they need it to be. And, and that's what we have to keep in mind. That's it's, what's it's not, it may not be what you want, but it's what they need. And that's so that, that's your obligation as a parent. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's it for today. Right. Um, so lots of things there to keep in mind, folks. But, um, you know, let us know if you have any questions or, uh, you know, good luck. It's, it's, it's tough. You know, yeah. divorces are difficult um, for everybody. <clears throat> and, um, but sometimes it's what needs to happen. And sometimes it's what, um, you know, we just have to weather all of that, those storms just to get through, uh, to have a happier, healthier life. So, right. Exactly. All right. Until next time. Okay. See you next time. Yes, you will. Hopefully you'll be up and moving around a little bit better then. So I'll be running marathons the next time you see me. All right. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and forget to be afraid.